Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. In this video, I'd like to delve into the topic of familial pulmonary fibrosis. And just to explain a little bit what this may be. So pulmonary fibrosis just means scarring of the lung tissue. So you can imagine the spongy tissues of the lungs, they may become scarred, hardened, thickened. Breathing may become more difficult and this can sometimes be a progressive condition worsening over time. So it's a major, major illness that needs to be identified early, treated early, because there are treatments that potentially can slow down progress. When we talk about familial cases of pulmonary fibrosis, we do suggest that there may be a predisposition running in that family. So for example, if a patient, let's say John, presents and they are 70 years old and they have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, maybe their brother also had fibrosis has been treated for a similar condition, or maybe some kind of related lung disease that may be linked to that predisposition. In those situations, we talk about familial cases of pulmonary fibrosis. Parents may have been affected as well. Children may be affected as well. And an interesting thing that can happen sometimes when we have predispositions in the family is that certain family members, as we progress through the generations, may develop these fibrotic conditions of the lung at the younger age, progressively. So this is something called genetic anticipation. So for example, if uh, John, let's say, develops idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in his 70s, it is possible that if there is a clear predisposition in the family, John's son, for example, may be at risk of, de of developing pulmonary fibrosis perhaps in his 50s or 60s, so at a progressively younger age. And the reason for that is because in many cases, familial pulmonary fibrosis is linked to something called telomere shortening. And I'll explain that, don't worry. So telomeres are, are basically the ends of the DNA, the long strand of DNA. So if you can imagine the DNA, which is the blueprint on which our body is built, is a very long strand of molecules that contains the genetic information required to build all the tissues in our body. Now, that DNA is contained within the nucleus of each cell. So the cells, as they multiply, as we want to grow some skin, for example, uh, fix a cut on our, on our hand, anything like that, the cells need to multiply and fill that space. So you can imagine, each time, a cell needs to divide and make two cells, that DNA needs to double because we need to have two cells where before there was just one. So telomeres are at the end of the DNA molecule and it is a structure, it's a part of the DNA, it's a repetitive line of code in the DNA basically that is thought to protect the DNA code when the cell multiplies into two cells. So these telomeres, they don't serve a specific purpose. They don't create proteins in the body or anything else, but they do tend to shorten every time there is a cell division. And it is thought that these telomeres hold the key to aging because telomeres can shorten over time. And if they shorten faster in certain individuals, you may tend to get genetic genomic instability. So the DNA may be more prone to developing other kinds of mutations as the cells multiply in the body. And this may be linked sometimes to tissue repair. And this is a big issue in pulmonary fibrosis because it's thought that cases in which the lungs become scarred are associated with an inability to repair proper, properly the damage that's been done by different environmental insults or infections or things like that. So the lungs, for example, may be bombarded every day of our lives by different things we inhale from the environment. We may catch a pneumonia, we may catch colds, etc. And then as the lungs need to repair, those telomeres in the cells of the lungs may progressively shorten. And in some individuals where there are some mutations in telomere related genes so which are genes that produce proteins that actually protect the ends of those chromosomes of the dna the ends that actually protect the rest of the dna if that makes sense when we have that sort of instability there may be a predisposition for these telomeres to shorten faster than expected so you may get premature aging in certain organs of the body. And it may not all be the same, but it may be more common if there is a lot of injury to the lung because it's exposed to the environment, 
there may be a higher turnover of cells, so the cells need to replace themselves more often, and you end up with this progressive shortening that's a bit faster, and at some point it reaches a critical shortening, which means that some of the new cells that are produced are unstable. They may not serve their purpose as they should. So this may lead to pulmonary fibrosis. The problem is it may lead to other conditions as well. So when people experience this telomere shortening that happens faster, it may lead to other conditions which are associated. So it could be related to blood disorders. It could be related to autoimmune conditions where the body produces abnormal immune responses against normal healthy tissues. Premature hair graying. So someone going gray in their early 20s, for example, may be something that we need to investigate sometimes. Not, so, not saying that everyone that has early gray hair has a problem with their telomeres, but it's something that comes to mind, especially if there's a lot of things in the family, a lot of different conditions, which seemingly cannot be connected, but it seems like there's a lot of illness in the family. And this is the concept of multimorbidity. And something that we, we do sometimes need to look into a little bit deeper. We are at the beginning of this field of research, let's just say we're just uncovering what's going on, but it's definitely something that will be very important in the next few years. So not all predispositions are known. Not all the genes that are associated with these telomeres have been identified. So some of these telomere related genes are known and we can test for them using genetic testing to see whether there is a genetic variant of that gene, if there's a variant, if there's a little mutation, a little change in the DNA that means that the protein produced by that bit of gene is abnormal, potentially. So that can lead to faster telomere shortening. We can also measure the length of the telomeres with various assays, with various tests. It can be done, for example, using blood, using a simple blood test, or it can sometimes be done by using a swab inside the mouth. So there are different techniques. Some of them have been more carefully validated than others, so some are better than others. But all of these things can be helpful in cases where we suspect that there is a familial predisposition for getting pulmonary fibrosis. So this is really interesting to me because it helps us sometimes identify patients who may be suffering with pulmonary fibrosis at an earlier stage. So if someone in the family has, let's say, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they end up getting a genetic test or a telomere measurement, and we find that the telomeres are critically shortened. It may be interesting in that case to look into these things a little bit deeper. The patient may then be referred to a clinical geneticist, basically to look into potential links to the rest of the family members. A, a family tree may be drawn to figure out who may be at risk because we know that some of these predispositions can be passed on in what is called an autosomal dominant manner. So that means that there's a 50-50 chance that siblings of that particular individual with the predisposition may carry a gene that can be associated with disease. So all of these things can be explored and then the individuals who are deemed to be at risk can be invited for genetic testing themselves. And we if we find that there is indeed a predisposition for getting, let's say, pulmonary fibrosis or other related conditions, then we may choose to follow up these patients or these people who actually may not have any illness at this stage at all to follow them up a little bit more closely. And if they do develop signs, for example, of pulmonary fibrosis, we may choose to intervene with treatment at an earlier stage when the treatment is likely to be more successful and to prolong life more. So this is really important. The other thing that's important to mention is that sometimes these predispositions, like I said, can be associated with other conditions, let's say blood disorders. So it may be possible that sometimes People who have these predispositions, they may not only suffer the consequences of developing pulmonary fibrosis, but they may also be more prone to, to getting all kinds of conditions which are associated with a high turnover of cells becoming abnormal, etc. So they may be more prone to cancers. They may, for example, not tolerate high doses of immunosuppressant, immunosuppressant medication, which is sometimes required to treat, for example, rheumatological disease. Or if these people receive some kind of a transplant, we need to be a bit more careful with the anti-rejection drugs that we need to give. So there are a lot of implications when there are these predispositions in the family. And this is where I wanted to stress a very important point. 
if there is a predisposition in the family, we need to treat it as a predisposition. So this is really, really important because sometimes there is an interaction between the predisposition, which is in our genes. We cannot really control that. We are born like that. But then the environment in which we, we live, the infections we're exposed to, all of these things play a role in developing disease. It's not just having the genetic variant, the genetic abnormality that leads to disease. There are many things that can go wrong and they can all compound themselves. So usually our advice when there is a predisposition in the family is to not panic in the first instance, to continue living life as normal, to try to get the genetic test, to have to have, have, take it day by day, step by step, get regular checkups, try to get treatments if certain illnesses appear and try to live a full life. It's really, really important to do that, to try to do that, to keep in touch with the doctors, but not in the sense that, oh, I found this uh, test to be positive. I've got this genetic variant abnormality and this will definitely lead to disease. It's not always the case. We cannot predict it very well. So this is really, really important to mention to you because some people would panic unnecessarily and it's really important to just discuss the matter with your doctors, discuss it with the clinical genetics service and counselors to try to understand in your case what is the real risk and what can be done next. But these are very sensitive topics that need to be had in a, in a fairly tactful manner. So just sitting down with your doctor, maybe with other family members together in a one big consultation and have an honest discussion of what may happen what are the treatment options? What may be done? And one other, things that, one other thing that I'd like to mention before I conclude, because there is increasing research in this field, there are actually trials which are looking at correcting some of these problems. So genomic medicine is coming and it may help us actually uncover secrets to treating disease, to prevent it from becoming a disease altogether. So there are trials underway, for example, to increase the length of telomeres. So there are things like that that are going on. It's not yet perfect. We're quite far from actually implementing genomic-based approaches to medicine, but it's coming. So there is hope for the future. That's what I mean. It's better to know, in my opinion, and to have a very pragmatic approach about what to do in the future but if you don't want to know, that's acceptable as well. So some people do not want to have a genetic test and that's absolutely fine. You don't have to have it because just because someone tells you or because your doctor thinks it might be a good idea. It should be your decision. And especially for younger individuals who have all their life ahead of them, probably making this decision to have a genetic test needs to be very carefully weighed because if it impacts on their future decisions about having children, for example, about how they will live their lives, it's really important to have these discussions in the appropriate context with a genetic counselor to just see what's the best decision. And in this field of pulmonary fibrosis, it is thought that most of these genetic variants, genetic mutations, abnormalities, whatever you want to call them, are just the basis of a predisposition. So it takes more than that to actually develop disease. So probably living a healthy lifestyle will go a long way into preventing or at least delaying the onset of pulmonary fibrosis or any associated conditions. Hope you found this interesting and helpful. If you have further questions, leave them in the comment section below and I'll try to make more videos of the same. All the best.